Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A verse for us today as we gather together and observe this All Saints Day, a verse for our meditation. 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father hath given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know what happens when he appears. We shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in himself is pure as he is. For many of us gathered here in God's house this morning, or joining us online, this is going to be a particularly tough service for us. Today serves as a reminder for all of us who have lost someone in the last year. Someone who has died and gone to be with Christ our Lord. Someone as a part of this worshiping body or connected to us in some way, shape, or form. So in a few moments as we stand and as we speak the names, as we toll the bell, you might hear the name of someone dearly loved and dearly missed. You might hear the name of someone whose friendship was important to you. Someone who maybe you didn't get a chance to say goodbye to due to COVID. Maybe a mentor in the faith you've lost. Or maybe it's someone you just sat next to in worship each and every Sunday and said good morning to, and their presence is missed. With their name spoken and the bell tolled, a rush of emotions can take us over. Sorrow, grief, and loss. The service will be difficult for many of us this morning. For a day of triumph in the church, a day where John can say, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, it certainly also bears with it the pain of living on this side of eternity. The emotion we feel as those names are read is also a stark reminder of the evil that continually surrounds us. As each name is spoken, each chime of the bell, we are reminded more and more that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Death, even at the end of a long and wonderful life, feels anything but natural, because it isn't. Death, in any case, is a consequence of the evil that is in this fallen nature of creation. We mourn the loss of others. Their absence hurts us. We cry, we get angry, and our grief manifests itself in many different ways unique to each of us. Death is the ultimate example of what is wrong with creation. Sin has twisted this once perfect, very good creation and wrought this havoc and pain we now suffer with today. The evil in the world around us, this random acts of evil that seemingly come from nowhere, this sickness we experience, the suffering we face, and ultimately death are signs of the evil in the world and in us. It's not just the world, because we're born into it passed down from generation to generation. We, too, sin. We hurt our neighbor. We do evil. And ultimately, the consequence is that we will die, too. Today, we, too, are faced with our own mortality. We stare it right in the face. We see that the consequences of sin is death. And the consequences of sin here on this earth are all over the place. As we see suffering sadness and struggle. For a day that's about the triumphant, it can feel like a day of defeat. Our list of names that we read through can feel more like a casualty list in a war that we're losing instead of a triumph. A day when evil seems to have another victory. A day we remember those we miss, for those we mourn and grieve for. A day we're reminded that evil certainly surrounds us and is in us. The enormity of the problem reminds us that it's completely out of our control. We see the depths of our despair for things that are not within our power to fix. We're stuck in this despair or grief or mourning, and the despair and the evil in the world and in us. There's not a thing we can do about it. And as we clearly see the evil in the world, as we see death all around us, it's important for us this morning to clearly see the work of Christ in us and in the world as well. It's for you, 
for the one who is despairing over the evil we're powerless to overcome. It's for you, the one caught in their never-ending grief and mourning. It's for you that John speaks, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. It's for us in the depths of our despair, in the depths of our powerlessness, that John tells us to see brightly the love that God the Father has for us. We don't ascend to God to see this majesty. Rather, he descends to us. He climbs into the pit of our despair, down into the muck and mire of what evil has done in the world and in us, and he calls us his own. John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. God calls us out of the darkness into his family. He climbs into the pit with us and carries us out of the darkness into his glorious light. He welcomes you and me into his family as his children, a family connected in the body of Christ our Lord. John tells us that our future is not what it seems. As we look around and see nothing but evil around us, the evil within, within us, the hopelessness we feel is not the end of the story. We've been united to a family whose future is not tainted with the sin, with evil, but rather a future won for it by Christ. John continues, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This hope we have united to the family of Christ, this faith that we have that Christ is truly Lord, that through his death, the sin and evil of the world is crushed and defeated, and that it is rising from the dead, a future unmarred by sin is ours. This hope, this faith, purifies us. It helps us to see that the future we expect, the future of evil and grief, is reversed in Christ our Lord. He gives us a hope to cling to when the situation is certainly hopeless and out of our ability to control. These words can seem too good to be true, especially those hurt and mourning this morning, especially when we're confronted with the bleakness of the situation. It can cause us to doubt God's love for us, the trust that our future is with Jesus, because how can someone deal with all the evil we suffer? This points to a future of gloom and sadness. It's easy to doubt that the grief we experience, the pain we experience, the suffering and evil we face, and are quite simply powerless to do anything about, have an end. Especially an end that is so freely given in Christ our Lord. Our assurance doesn't come from us. It's not found in trying harder or looking deeper in our hearts. Our assurance comes from the very word of God itself. I like the emphasis the NIV gives on our words from John this morning. It says it like this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God has spoken, and it is so. As God speaks, and there is light, he speaks, and we are made children of God. His word does what he wills it to do. He proclaims us children in our baptisms. We're baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and it's so. And we're part of the family. There's no doubt that we are loved by God because he has proclaimed it himself. There's no doubt that God calls us and makes us part of the family. He speaks in it, it is so. The words of our Lord are greater than any evil that would tell us otherwise. God takes us from our pit of suffering, from our despair and grief, and brings us into the light of his family. And in an instant, he reverses the misery of evil. God's kingdom, his family he's invited us into, is one of reversals. God takes people like us caught in their sin, caught in their grief, caught in their suffering, things we're powerless to defeat, and welcomes them into his family into his kingdom. And in his kingdom, the evil and wrongs we experience are engaged and confronted by Christ our Lord. And Jesus teaches this to his disciples as he begins the Sermon on the Mount, our gospel reading for today. 
And here are a few highlights of those beatitudes we spoke about earlier. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Being welcomed into the family of God, a sure and certain thing, being made citizens of the kingdom gives us hope in all of our struggles. His kingdom brings blessings to those who face the evil of the world and the evil within themselves. So for those who come to God's house this morning, crushed by things they cannot fix, for those whose sin, whose loss, whose grief feels overwhelming, whose very soul feels crushed under the weight of it all, today, here and now, in God's house, you are blessed. And this present tense blessing has come to you by what God has done. God has purified you. He's made you part of his kingdom. What you are powerless to change, Christ our Lord has come to fix. The blessing is for you today of hope that Christ, your champion, is always victorious, no matter the evil you face. For those who mourn the death of someone in the last year, or mourn a loss unknown to us, Christ comes to you in your grief with a promise of blessing. Blessed are you, because you will be comforted. Grief for our loved ones feels like it will never go away. It will never be set right. Our blessing is promised from our Savior. What appears to be a wound that will never heal is promised to be reversed. Christ our Lord promises us that there is a time when our grief will stop, when the mourning of loss will cease. And this is the day that he raises the dead, when together, face to face, we see the Lord. The blessing you have is the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, where God turns our endless grief into hope. Hope that our future is not marked by that grief that wounds us so grievously, that Christ has come to put an end to it. For the meek, for those who feel powerless to change your circumstances in life, for those who suffer from lack and want, who feel like no matter the struggle, life can't get any easier. Our Lord comes in blessing to tell you of the righting of these wrongs. Those who lack anything will have all they need in his kingdom. That this constant and endless struggle you face has an end in Jesus' reign. His blessing gives us hope when we feel there is none. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for those who are so tired of the evil that seems to have victory after victory in this world, for those who feel hopeless in the face of evil, and because of the sin within ourselves, we can't just seem to get around, Jesus comes with a blessing for you in his kingdom. His death has brought about the total and utter defeat of evil. And when he comes again on the clouds, the blessing for us is that he will overcome everything we cannot ourselves. He puts evil under his feet. He defeats sin, death, and the devil. He conquers it like a conquering champion. Jesus offers us in this Sermon on the Mount a few glimpses of the glory that is coming in his kingdom. A kingdom where all wrongs are set right. Where what looks like defeat, what looks like endless misery, becomes victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. This small little glimpse into what our Lord is doing in his family and in his kingdom gives us hope. Hope that what we are powerless to fix ourselves our sin, our suffering, our grief and loss, is made right in Christ. There's no greater image of this than the image given to us in the book of Revelation. Imagine for a moment countless generations of people just like you, who've experienced all of the evil this world has to offer. And they too have sinned. And you can imagine that Christ our Lord, finding them where he found us, in that same pit of despair and hopelessness, you can imagine the robes about them tattered and muddied beyond all recognition, 
truly in the depths of woe. Yet it is Jesus who's called to them as he's called to us. And he beckons them through baptism, places his name on them, and invites them into the family. Christ invites them to take their sin, their sorrow, and lay it on him. That all of their suffering that's stained and tattered their robes. And he invites them to wash in the blood that he so freely gives for them. And in an instant, that muddied and tattered cloth becomes radiant becomes brighter with hope than anything we've ever seen before. And these people, made pure in the blood of the Lamb, stand together around the throne of God, the very God who saved them, who defeated unbeatable odds. And together with a loud voice proclaim, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Christ our Lord has given us hope And those who have gone on before us now get to experience the fullness of what it means to be in the presence of Christ our Lord. The fullness of the promises that he's given. You see, Jesus takes the evil of death, the evil that we are mourning in loss here today, and he turns it into triumphal good news. That the names we're about to hear in a few moments, while we miss them, while we mourn them, while their loss grieves us, We celebrate in victory because Christ has conquered death. What seems impossible, what seems hopeless, Jesus has turned into blessing for his people. So this day is sorrowful. We miss people. We miss our loved ones. We miss our family members who are no longer with us. But it's a day to remember Christ and his promises. Promises that turn that sorrow into blessing because of what he's done for you and for me. So God's blessings to you today, in whatever shape he finds you in, that he may give you his peace. Amen.